All right. So, David Chesky, good to uh, have you on. And we're going to talk, obviously, about your new album, The Abreu Danzas, which is out this week as of the date that this will be launched. But we also want to talk about you, your career, Chesky Records, how all of this came to be. So could you just sort of give us a little bit about yourself, where you came from, how you got started in music? Yeah, I started off as a studio musician and arranger, pianist, composer, and I started off doing film and television. And then, uh, you know, I was also playing jazz on the side. And then one day in the studio, I wanted to start a label. And I used to be a conductor. And I said, you know, I'd like to start a label from the perspective of a conductor. Where I stand, it sounds the best. And that's where I got the idea to do it with one point stereo microphone. So we started the label and all we've been doing forever, except for a few things is, you know, one point uh, miking stereo microphone or two uh, regular microphones. The thing that you mentioned to me previously that maybe a lot of people don't know, I'll be curious to hear a little bit more about is you growing up were a big fan of hard rock, metal, that kind of stuff. And you slowly transitioned into being more into jazz and classical. Can you talk a little bit about how that metamorphosis happened? Yeah, when I was growing up in junior high, <laughs> excuse me, junior high, I like rock like everybody else. And I grew up with a lot of guys who went into the metal business, still friendly with them today. And, uh, you know, it just kind of diverged that way. If you would have told me when I was 16 years old that I'd be writing operas and symphonies and ballets, I would have said you're crazy because I thought I would be uh, a rock and roll musician. And But things change and it's the way it is. But, you know, I can see there's some kind of connection with metal, the energy and passion and with classical music. Because if you take like whole uh, the planets, the first piece, Mars. I mean, that's really the first heavy metal piece ever written. If you just, you know, the orchestra's going dun, 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 dun. I mean, that just lays down the whole groove for the metal scene right there. What do you think sort of facilitated this, this, the shift? Was it slowly finding composers that you liked? Was it um, the studying of it when you were in school? What do you think really facilitated your growing interest in classical and jazz? You know, it's just more interesting for me as a composer. It's sort of like when you start cooking, you add a little salt, a little pepper. Then you, you get bored, you want some hot sauce, you want this and that. You need to kick it up all the time. And I found that pop music was a little limiting, limiting for me, and I was more interested in classical, which you can do much more with counterpoint, layering, you know, orchestrating. It's, it's a much bigger, it's like a puzzle. Just think of it like a puzzle. It's just a much bigger puzzle. It's a giant jigsaw puzzle, and it's very fascinating from a composer's point of view. Uh, I guess if you're a player, maybe being in orchestra is not as interesting, but as a composer, you have this giant palette with six million colors to choose from. So it's just, it's a fun toy. So you're growing up, you're in Miami, you're in a band in junior high and high school. How do you get to New York? What's the, what facilitates that step? The day I got out of high school, my mother gave me a one-way plane ticket to New York, and that was it. Done. And this is where I've been ever since, and I love it because New York is a great place for me to get inspiration. You know, it's got an energy. And even my, though my music today is very orchestral, Latin jazz and things like that, it reflects the energy of the city. So you start up here as a studio musician, right? Yeah, I became a studio musician to make a living. Obviously, you know, playing jazz in the clubs, it was hard to get by in those days. So somebody said, why don't you orchestrate for some television shows and movies? I didn't even know what this was, but I went and I got a job one day. They hired me, they liked my work. And then I be became doing a lot of these things scoring every single day and that's where you really learn it's not even about college when you're really working every day in a studio with 80 musicians and one the next day 15 the next day 100 with a choir you really get your act together really quick and you so your debut album comes out on columbia records how does that come to be well, I had a band back then, the uh, big band, and we used to play at a place called Storyville in the Village Vanguard, on, sometimes on the off nights. And, you know, we did a demo and Columbia Records signed us, and that's how I got my first record deal back then. And obviously a lot of people know your work as a composer and as a musician, but you've obviously produced hundreds of records at this point. Where does that process slowly start to come in in your story are you doing that at this point or is it only when you started the label 
uh, I started producing, well, I was producing for other people, but mostly as an arranger, orchestrator, you know, I would get hired. I was a gun for hire. Somebody needed horns or string arrangements, they would call me up, somebody needed this and that. But then when I started the label, then I produced, you know, all the uh, records on the label. So talk to me about that founding process. What, what made you want to start your own label and what made you want to start that process in, was it 1986? Yeah, because I was getting really interested in audio, you know, when you pretty much live in a studio, you hear sounds all the time. And at the same time, I liked speakers, I liked amplifiers, I always liked these things. And I would say, you know, where I stood as a conductor, it sounded great, but when they used 50 microphones and everything, and multi mic it, it didn't sound so good on the playback. But since I was just a work for hire doing movies and television, I just sat there and whatever they wanted to do, they did. But I learned a lot from this. And I said, you know what? It sounds great where I stand. If I ever do my own label, I want to do it from a one mic perspective, just like a conductor. And that's how I got the idea to do all this like this. And so your first couple records are with Johnny Frigo, um, John Pizzarelli. Who, what was the process and who you wanted to work with? Why those artists? Why those records specifically at the beginning? Why those records? I'm going to tell you why. Because it was a place where all the musicians would hang out to wait for jobs and they were just there and we met them and I knew all these people. These were guys I worked with in the studio all the time. So we just said, look, we're going to do a label. Come on over and let's start with you. Uh, we'll do you, Bucky, first. And then so we did Clark, Terry Nex, and Phil Woods. And these are guys I played with and knew. So this is sort of how it all happened. And then it grew from there. You know. How much of those experiences working with those guys impacted the stuff that you were writing as, your, as a musician yourself? Not really. It was separate. You know, those guys are more traditional. My stuff is a little more out there, you know, cutting edge stuff. But I dig it. Look, they were amazing musicians, you know, masters. And, you know, music is like Baskin and Robbins. It's all good. There's just many, 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 many flavors. And it's the same thing with recording. Look, you know what? I have a French restaurant. I like to record in a big church with one microphone. That's my thing. But the guy next door to me may want 24 microphones tight and he's an Italian restaurant and it's all good and that's his flavor. And the next guy may only want to do binaural records and the next guy may want to only do recordings in a jazz club. But that's what makes for diversification. There's no right way or wrong way in art. It's just the taste you like, you know? And there's plenty of rock and roll records I would never do, but sound great, you know? And, and in that genre, they captured a certain way. So you've talked a little bit about the, what has stayed the same over the 30 plus years that you've been making music. What would you say has changed and has been either a positive or a negative of those changes? Well, I just think today, you know, with the internet, things change so fast and so rapidly, it's harder for people to make records and uh, actually make money on them. In the old days, uh, people would tour to promote the record. Now you make a record to promote your tour. In the old days, guys could live up in Woodstock and live off the royalties of their record. Today with streaming, that's not going to happen. You get big so you can go out and get a big you know, paycheck for a live performance. So it's sort of inverse. And that, was, and that was definitely the case prior to March of 2020. And obviously none of us are Nostradamus, but how do you think what's going on in society is going to impact that paradigm moving forward where who knows when we'll be able to go back and tour again? You know what? I don't know, but it's very interesting. Darwinism, you adapt. You know, we're learning how to adapt now, to do new things. People I notice doing clubs, uh, concerts online. Uh, you know, look, uh, I know a jazz club and normally it holds like 150 people a night. They did a concert and they had like 2,000 people. Now, the band would never get 2,000 people in a week there, so it's, they reach a bigger audience. So you're just having to adapt in the circumstance. You know, if I was, this will be an interesting time for creativity because I think we're not gonna go forward linearly. We're gonna take a sharp turn and something is gonna happen. It's like shaking out the trees. Uh, a lot of things will close and a lot of new things are gonna open up. And so the Abreu Danzas is your newest release. Can you talk to me a little bit about what the music is about, how that came to be, what's different about this record from your previous? Well, this, you know, I have a few styles, but this is in my Latin style. I grew up in Miami, a very Latin city. And New York, the Upper West Side is, you know, there's a lot of Latin music here. So it's something I live with every day. 
and I try to take this rhythm and put it in an orchestral form. You know, in or modern music and orchestra, it's always slow. It seems today modern music is very cerebral. It's very introspective. Everybody's looking for the meaning of life. Uh, you know, this type of thing. And this music is the exact opposite. It's about passion. It's about energy. It's about let's go, let's move and get in the subway hustle because, you know, art has to reflect time and culture. And I don't live in uh, the north of Finland looking at the stars at night. I live in the middle of Manhattan where everybody's saying, get out of my way, hustle, I'm late for work. And this is what I try to capture. There's an energy in this city that there's nowhere else in the world. And there's, a, there's rhythm and there's syncopation and classical music doesn't have these elements and it needs to have these elements to be relevant, I think, to uh, reflect what's going on. You know, normally when you go into a concert hall today, you see uh, a classical music, which was written for uh, 300 years ago for a king sitting on a throne 6,000 miles away. I don't want to write that. I want to write things for what's happening right now on Broadway, two blocks from my house. So this is what this music is about, is to get the energy of Latin music, jazz music, pop syncopated rhythms, and put them into an orchestral form. So if you're not even into classical music, but you like Latin music, you can relate. There's something there organically to relate to. It's not going to be some ambiguous thing that you have no relationship to. So we both live in New York City in different neighborhoods. And I mean, I haven't even seen that much of my neighborhood during all this, but what's, you talk about sort of the feel and the vibe of the city, how much of that has changed in your neighborhood during all this? And will there be music that reflects that? That's a good question. I don't know. You know, New Yorkers are a tough breed with the spirit. You know, it doesn't feel bad to me. Look, you know, 9-11 was awful. When I lived here, I was actually on my way down to the trade centers because I had to go to jury duty and I just missed getting on the subway. But I mean, that was awful. But we came back and we'll get through this. You know, it's just part of the city of the New Yorkers that were resilient. And we're tough on the outside, but we get through things. So I think we'll get through it. And it, it'll, you know, be a speeding ticket. We'll get past it. And just like we did 9-11 and things will go on and people will write about this and that's it. But I don't like to sit here and be pessimistic, okay? We have this situation, we'll deal with it. You know, Stravinsky still wrote great music during the war, Ravel and all these guys had tougher times, you know, in World War II and World War I back then. So we'll get through this, you know? Right, that's sort of like where I was going with the question was, is there, is what's going on now inspiring anything for you to be writing or is it inspiring you to reflect the current mood, even if it is a temporary negative sort of dour mood? Is that something that inspires you also? Yes. And, and as a matter of fact, my next record is going to be on the sad side. I'm going to, I'm going to capture all this in the, my next record and do a record all on this. I'm planning it out now. A lot of it's written already. And um, that'll be the next record. So sort of a, a quick sidebar while still on Abreu Danza's, Larissa Martinez makes a feature performance. Can you talk a little bit about what she brings to the table and why you went with her specifically? Yes, a few reasons. First of all, um, she's a great singer and amazing and a, a great conductor recommended her and said, look, she's perfect for it. And I heard her sing and she was great. And also, it's a Latin song, and I think her growing up in Puerto Rico, she can really relate to the feel of the music. It's, you know, I can, if I got another soprano from somewhere else, they could learn it, but do they really learn it and feel it? You know what? It's like this. If I went to China and I taught guys how to play jazz, they could play the notes, but are they going to feel it like guys who grew up with it in Harlem? I don't think so. So part of it's your experience. So by her growing up in this Latin world, she really organically feels the music and understands it. And you don't even have to tell her. She just gets it. So that's why. And she just did an amazing job. What are you hoping that someone who's listening to you for the first time or for the thousandth time gets from the new album? I hope they enjoy it. You know, you're not going to find the meaning of life in this record. It's basically fun. It's energetic and it's to have a good time. You know, if you want to you find the meaning of life, I have my heart by Mach Fry and my songs, which are very sad. But this music is just joyous. It's capturing a colorful culture that has a lot of passion 
and it's about joy and happiness and having a great time. So obviously you're not done. There's still a lot more music to be made, but with 2021 coming up being 35 years of Chesky Records, this is sort of an opportunity for reflection. Are there any big moments or artists or albums that looking back on really stick out to you for the history of the label? I don't know. There's some interesting, obviously the first one, because we didn't have a clue what we, you know, we just said, let's do it. Johnny Frigo, Bucky Pizzarelli. That was an amazing session because it was the first time we got in the studio with one microphone. I mean, that is it. Uh, there was another session, you know, we did Mango Santa Maria when RCA Studios was closing. And that was kind of sad because that was one of the most amazing studios you've ever seen in the world because it had a stage that could, you know, the room could get bigger and smaller. You could adjust it. It was just one of these great studios that went away. You know, when I was doing this stuff 30 years ago in New York City, you had 40, 50, 100 big studios everywhere. You had guys everywhere working, but we don't have this anymore. We only have a handful of large studios and most things, as you know, are done in the box. So those were two uh, sessions, you know, I totally remember. I mean, and also the, the things I did in Europe with my orchestra pieces, you know, were pretty cool too. But as far as the label, I'd have to say, you know, Johnny Frigo live at Studio A, because we were all virgins walking into this giant space and saying, well, is it gonna work or not? Oh, well, for anyone listening, David Chesky's Abreu Donza's are available now chesky.com hd tracks um different parts of the world will be available in october so check with your digital service providers see where it's available but chesky.com for more information thank you david for taking the time to chat with us thanks so much have a great day ciao